Hi everyone, welcome to the next episode of The Room. We're so excited to be up here in Atchison, Kansas at beautiful Benedictine. Um, it is such a historic, beautiful campus. I love being up here and we're so excited to have so many great student athletes with us today. This is the fourth episode of The Room and this episode is called um, Develop. So how do we work together as teams? How do we develop strong teams? The previous sessions, the first session we recorded at Park University was lead. So who are you as a leader? What are those important skills um, as a leader? And then we had engage, which is communication skills and how we use those. Um, acceptance, which is all about creating a environment of belonging. And then tonight we're recording develop. And then we're really excited. The final two sessions are gonna be recorded and that is effective. So how do we get things done? And then resilience, what happens when <laughs> It doesn't work the way we, we want it to. Um, and we're really excited for the program um, and the reason why it's called The Room is because the skills that we talk about are so important, whether it be in the classroom or the locker room or the boardroom. So let's jump in, let's, let's meet our panelists. So if you will introduce yourself to the group. Great, thanks Katie. My name's Doug Gomer. I'm the market president for First Interstate Bank out of Kansas City. Uh, I've been in banking for 16 years. Prior to that, I've been leading teams actually since I was uh, 30, so 26 years. Well, God, I just revealed my age. I worked for Coke Industries down in Wichita uh, for seven years, Westar for seven years, banking for 17, and then a, a two-year stint for, a, for an investment firm. Well, hello, everybody. Katie, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Patrick Hodap. I'm the director of sports medicine here at, at Benedictine College. Uh, I've been here for 19 years, so I, that'll age me, I suppose. Um, next will be my 20th season here at the college. Absolutely love Benedictine College through and through. Um, I started out at a small uh, junior college, worked my way up through the University of Kansas, um, was lucky enough to work for the Kansas City Chiefs um, in the late 90s, uh, worked for Sporting Kansas City, who was the Kansas City Wizards at the time for four years, and then actually fell here, um, not thinking I was gonna be here long, but absolutely fell in love with this place and have been here ever since, so. Hey guys, <laughs> um, I'm Brooklyn Wozni. I am a senior at Benedictine, majoring in journalism and mass communications. And yeah, I'm on the dance team. Great. And I'm the leader of the Raven Athletic Leadership Council. So, The first part we want to talk about is interpersonal skills. When we talk about developing strong teams, it's really important to make sure that we have strong interpersonal skills. And part of their skills are the communication, empathy, positive attitude, and teamwork. And we've talked about some of those through our previous sessions. How would you rate your interpersonal skills? We have two people that say they are fantastic at it. That is good. That is good. <laughs> Confidence, I love it. Um, but the bulk of people, I'm um, pretty good, and then a couple of you need work. Um, that's awesome. No matter where we are in our career journey, whether we're just starting out or moving along, there's always things we can do to develop those skills. So we're going to ask the panel the exact same question. So Doug, we'll start with you. Um, when you think about your uh, interpersonal skills, how do you rate those? Um, well, first, I want to say whoever rated themselves as uh, above average or whatever, exceptional, I'd uh, like to talk to you afterwards and get your resume. Uh, we'd be very interested in hiring you. You know, it's... Uh, these are foundational skills that, you, that Katie's identified. <clears throat> so in my mind, uh, there's always room for improvement. So you can always get better at being a, uh, with your interpersonal skills, how you communicate. And it's both verbal and nonverbal with how you communicate. And I'll say, you know, the other uh, element that's, that should be getting a lot more attention, and I know it's an area that I tr continue to try to focus on as a leader, is that empathy side. It's really, they talk about the emotional quotient, the EQ. Um, just really being able to understand where people and, and it, it really probably matters a lot for um, the teams that you guys are on, understanding how your teammates are feeling, the role that they're playing. Uh, you know, you can't be on every day. Would be great if we could, but you're not on every day. Being able to have that emotional quotient, being able to relate to the people and have some, it's more than just sympathy. It really is being able to connect with them in a, in a deeper way, being able to relate with them and also let them know, hey, you know, I've got you. It's okay that you're struggling. You know, we've, we've got your back. That's the whole essence of a team that we'll talk about later. But. Yeah. Yeah, so I'd, I'd say um, I'm, I'm better than most, but I've still got a lot of room for improvement. Perfect. I think that from a mentor standpoint, uh, it's about communication, education. It's all about being able to 
communicate and portray what ultimately is the outcome for that student athlete. Um, when reversing that for the student athlete and how we communicate, I think that, that hopefully develops them for the long term, not only when dealing with hardship, but also potentially dealing with a potential job opportunity. So when you look at those, those skills that develop, and I, I believe you touched upon it, th those are lifelong skills. Like, like if you don't feel confident in where you're at right now, try it. Try to push yourself a little bit when you look at those. Um, get, out, get out of your comfort zone and, and, and really try to, to stretch yourself as far as you possibly can go when you look at that. Something I feel like I am good at is the communication portion of it. Like whether it's with this group of athletes, like communicating what we're doing, whether it's a meeting like this meeting tonight or like what's coming up. I feel like that's something that I am good at, but something I do lack is what we're saying over here is empathy. I feel like whether it's like with my team and I'm leading my team, sometimes I'm not really the most empathetic on like the situations that are going on. So that's probably what I'd have to say. To me, so. Well, and when we talk about building teams, and especially in the corporate world, um, we talk a lot about silos and, you know, we can see that in college athletics as well. And I think the NAIA does a beautiful job of breaking down silos. You know, you see athletes um, rooting for other teams and showing up at other people's events, but silos are really those, um, you know, this is my team, my department, my area, and this is all I'm going to focus on. And so we've really got to make sure in the corporate world that we're breaking down those silos and it's not just you know, our team, but we're really looking at the whole organization. And I think the NAI does a really nice job mm -hmm. with that. So, so Doug, when you think about organizations, whether it's in a college or a company, at times we unintentionally develop those silos. Mm -hmm. How do you recommend we build relationships across the whole organization and avoid those silos? Mm. It's a really good question. Um, as, as you mentioned, silos can, can really be a cancer in an organization. It not only destroys teamwork and chemistry, but it also uh, erodes creativity, collaboration, ideation, employee engagement. Um, and in an organization, a little different athletics, in an organization, the relative advantage every organization strives for is to learn at a rate that exceeds that of, her, of their competition. If you can learn and convert that into meaningful action, you're gonna have a relative advantage over your competition. That's all we can ask for because today, right, the, the, the gap closes so quickly. So when I think about um, how, we, uh, <clears throat> the, how we have to erode silos, it really begins with culture. Mm -hmm. And I'm always hesitant to bring it up because I'm assuming everybody here is watching Ted Lasso. If you're not, you need to stream <laughs> Ted Lasso. Um, there's a lot of great business applications with what Ted Lasso did and a silo. And if you think about, and really get back to that first season, um, and this is what I think organizations ought to do. You know, it starts with making sure you have the right team. Jamie, Jamie Tartar, I think was his last name, right? That mm -hmm. he, he was an exceptional talent on the team, but he was all about himself. He wasn't part of the team. You have to have the right team, which isn't necessarily the most talented team. So he had to make some pretty difficult decisions. And I, I gotta tell you, that's the first thing you have to do is have the right team, people that understand your mission, vision, and values and buy into it. And I try to hire, when I, when I talk about the right team, I really try to hire more on attributes. And when I think about attributes, it's charisma, it's presence, it's communication skills, it's trust, um, it's um, your character. I mean, the, the, the values, your, your moral system. I can tell you more companies are thinking more like that and a little less about what your skills are. I mean, it's just because we can teach you the skills. Mm -hmm. I can't teach you values very well. Or I should say, you probably have your values. That's a great thing about coming to Benedictine. I know you guys have that. Um, but, so I get aside. So first, have the right team. Second, you have to have a, a clear understanding of your mission, vision, and values, and make sure you're hiring people, and that you, you not just put words on a paper. A lot, of, a lot of companies have some great mission statements, but then they don't live it. That's, a, that's a, how silos start to get yeah. created. Third. Um, is a clear understanding of roles, responsibilities, and expectations. You guys have that as when you play your sports, you know your roles well. Same thing happens in, a, in an organization. Everybody has to clear understanding of the roles, responsibilities, and expectations. And by that, one of those roles is you're going to be a good team player. That's, uh, that's a little different than how a basic job description. We really try to think about the role you're going to play in our organization as a team player to make sure that we don't have those silos. So Patrick, with that in mind, you know, how we work together, Collaboration is so important when we're on teams. How do you foster a culture of collaboration to gather new information and share ideas? 
there's, there's quite a few different aspects when we look at this. And the first one I look at is trust. So like, in order to facilitate collaboration, you have to trust the people around you, okay? So let's look at my profession, for example. I, I have to trust every single other athletic trainer in my department, because I can't be every place at every time and anywhere. So I have to trust that my other fellow staff members are gonna be able to care for the athletes at, to, up to that level that I want them to want it to be at. Um, so that's kind of the first thing. And this sounds strange, but vulnerability. Like in order to facilitate collaboration, you have to be able to be vulnerable. And by being vulnerable, it allows you to open up to not only the group of collaboration, but also like allowing to put yourself out there to show everyone else you're collaborating with that you are willing to go that extra mile. You're willing to show that, that one, you care. I mean, I'll, I'll piggyback on your previous comment. Like you, you have to show that, that it is the top, the highest priority to you, especially when you're collaborating, you're looking at ideas, especially solving a problem, collaborating to solve a problem. So ultimately that's when it, then you have to have a common direction. And, and that kind of is a, 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 almost any aspect of life, you have to have a direction, you have to have a goal, you have to have move forward, always forward. Everyone here in the room knows that, right? Forward, always forward, <laughs> okay? So we have always in my department looked at that as, as if we're not progressing, we're regressing. And we never want to regress. We always want to move forward, even in the smallest facet. So that might be something on education. That might be something as simple as devoting more time, okay? But it doesn't always have to be something big. It can be something very small. It can be in small incremental steps when we look at that. The other thing is vision. So you have to have vision for a common goal. You have to have a vision for an endpoint. You have to have vision when you move forward in any aspect of that collaboration because ultimately you're collaborating for an end game, right? You're collaborating to have a final product, a final solution. So vision. And then this is probably the one I'm most proud of for my staff specifically is flexibility. You have to be able to kind of move, you know, roll with the punches per se. You have to be able to, if a problem does arise, you have to be flexible enough to, to respond to those. And ultimately, you, again, back to your vision, back to the end of the, end of the day, you want to find a, a resolution, a solution to that. Um, and then finally, I, I think candor, it plays a big role when we look at collaboration. You have to be able to, one, say, I'm wrong, okay? And if, if you're, if you're hard-nosed, if you're, if you're, if you're stubborn, that's not gonna help in a collaborative effort. So ultimately you have to look at candor and you have to look at yourself and say, maybe I don't know everything and maybe the, the guy or gal next to me knows a lot more about something and utilize that information and, and be able to, again, find that, that end product. So that's kind of when we look at collaboration, that's kind of how, how we operate here, so. I love that and it is so important. It's hard for us to not always wanna be the smartest person in the room, but I mean, to get really good collaboration we do have to be open to hearing everyone's voice as well. So, perfect.